thankful for our opportunity this morning to come here and worship you. Father, we pray that everything we do this morning will be in accordance with your will, in accordance with your word. And we pray that you will find our worship pleasing in your sight. Father, this morning we have so many things to pray for. We have more than 70 on our sick list printed on our bulletin. And we know there's probably many more that we are connected with that, that need your prayer, need a prayer right now, that are either struggling physically or struggling in some other way. And Father, we ask your blessings on them at this time, and we ask that your will will be done, but that you will hopefully restore them to their health so that they can be able to rejoin us. Father, we also pray for our country during these unprecedented times. We ask that you be with us, that you give us the strength and the faith and the courage to be the kind of examples in our communities, in our workplaces, in our interactions. That will help break through some of the hardness that is so divisive right now in our country. Father, we ask that you give us the strength to realize that the battle does belong to you, that the trials and tribulations that we endure, the depressing times that we endure because of the pandemic, it's all temporary. And we know that you're going to take care of us. Father, we pray that you continue to be with the eldership here, that you bless them as they guide us. Father, we pray that you help us to carry with us the greatest gift that mankind's ever been given, and that was the fact that you sent your Son to die on the cross for our sins. Father, help us to spread that. We close this prayer by thanking you again for all your blessings, all the things that we take for granted. We ask for these things, and we pray that you will help us to get our hearts right as we continue this worship service. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number 332. 332. This song will prepare our minds for King of my life, I crown thee now, I shall the glory be.
Is there anyone who uh, didn't get a chance to get the disposable communion cup when they came in? If so, just raise your hand and someone will bring one to you. Uh, when I was very young, four, five, six years old, um, my parents used to let me bring coloring pencils and coloring book to draw and color during the, the worship service. And this was more for the people around me than me because I was an extremely obnoxious uh, five-year-old. Uh, I, I wasn't going to pay attention, and if I wasn't focused on doing something, I was going to distract everyone. And so that's what I would do through service. I'd draw in my coloring book, and till it came time to do the communion, where they would make me put the book away for the eight to 10 minutes it took, and they'd say, you're gonna pay attention and you're gonna sit quietly. And I didn't understand it then, uh, I understand it now, but I didn't understand it then. And so to me, communion was the most boring time of the service. Uh, last week, I wasn't able to make it to service. I was, uh, Preston and I went on a trip up to Mississippi where we were going to camp out for the PlayStation 5. Um, and we went and saw his brother, and uh, we, weren't, we didn't get the PlayStation. That's not the point. Uh, um, we... We were at his brother's house, ready to drive back to Florida Sunday morning. And so we were going to be driving during the church stream, and we weren't really comfortable taking communion while we were driving. So before we left, it was like 7 in the morning, uh, we got together, me, Preston, and Hunter, and we took communion. We poured each other some grape juice and had some pre-made communion uh, bread, and we took it together. Uh, it was it was good that you know we could do that remotely. We didn't have to have this setting to remember Christ, and it was good. But it wasn't the same. You know, it's it's tough to replicate what we're doing right now. We, as the family, as the body of Christ, are about to remember, intimately remember, our Savior and our Lord. It says in Mark, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given it to them, he said, uh, he had given thanks, he said to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we love you, we worship you as Lord. And we remember you and your sacrifice through your Son, Christ. Uh, we ask that we can do this together, that we can intimately remember you, that we can, as a family and as a group of your followers and believers, uh, pay you honor in this moment as we remember your Son and his sacrifice. This we ask through Christ. Amen.
Let's pray for the juice. Uh, Father in heaven, we continue our prayer. Uh, and now we remember your son's blood that was spilled, the innocent blood that was given on our behalf to cleanse us from our sins, um, to wash away all of our unrighteousness, and to give us the opportunity to be in a relationship with you and to live in a home in heaven that you've prepared for us. We pray this again in Christ's name. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper at this time. Uh, due to COVID, um, as you well know, we uh, aren't able to pass out the collection tray like we normally would. Um, but with that being said, there's a box in the foyer that you can leave your donation or your offering uh, if you so choose. Uh, let's say a quick prayer over that right now. Uh, Father, you've blessed us immensely. Father, you've given us more than we even realize you've given us. Uh, you love us. You continue to bless us. Help us find it in our hearts uh, to repay that blessing, uh, to offer just a portion of it to you in sacrifice. This we pray through Christ. Amen. Scripture reading for today will be from Daniel 6, verses 6 through 23, or 16 through 23, sorry. That is Daniel chapter 6, verses 16 through 23. 
So the king, the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of the, his lords, and the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I, have found innocent, I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. We want to welcome you all here. Uh, if you are here with us in person, uh, we want to welcome you. But also, if you are here with us via our live stream, we want to welcome you as well. We know these are uh, challenging times with um, the coronavirus going on, and some of you may not be comfortable yet um, being with us here in person or just don't want to wear a mask for an hour. We understand um, it is very difficult, um, and so we still want to welcome you, and, and we're glad to have these opportunities that we can still uh, reach you guys via our live stream and online. It's such a blessing that we have. Um, so on Family Sundays, the elders and uh, some of the ministers have been uh, talking about just rotating through some of us to speak on different Family Sundays. And so last Family Sunday, you had Nick preach, um, and he spoke to us about the book of Jonah. And then obviously this Family Sunday, I am speaking, and then the next one, Walt will speak, and we'll keep rotating like that. Um, and it's been a real blessing to be able to uh, just rotate and keep things a little fresh and get new perspectives and get people, different people up here speaking to you guys. Um, and that's a real blessing for me as well to get more opportunity just to be up and to preach the word of God because it's very, it's something that is very new to me preaching in this setting at least. Um, Nick and I were room together and so as his lesson, it caught a lot of traction with you guys, uh, which is very, very good. Um, and he spoke on the book of Jonah. And he got me thinking um, because a lot of people responded to his, his lesson and it was, it was very positive and it was about something, it was a perspective that they have never heard before on the book of Jonah. And it was basically that their whole lives or when they were little they were taught Jonah a certain way, but it was almost completely wrong. It was, you know, that's not the story of Jonah, that's not what, was, uh, what the story was about, or you were just told wrong as a child or as a young person in the faith. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing all the time. Um, a lot of times we do te teach our children these stories, and um, some of them we try to bring the message to them in a lighthearted way, and so we don't really scar them, or however you want to say it. But a lot of times you don't revisit the story and that becomes a problem when you don't revisit the story as, as an older adult and you don't really get the theme that the story is really trying to tell because as a kid you didn't understand it and then you don't revisit it so you don't you don't get it um, and so we started talking how we're gonna piggyback off each other because there's a lot of stories that this happens to and uh, so we're going to piggyback every family Sunday that Nick and I we're going to keep going through so-called children's stories and kind of taking out that idea that these stories are for children and looking at them from an adult perspective looking at them for what they truly are trying to say the true message and so I'm gonna admit I kind of dropped the ball on this one I kind of fumbled um, I was supposed to post a prom promo video. It's supposed to be like a really awesome video, my, my best one yet. Um, <clears throat> but um, I was looking for, you know, uh, 
some people may know this, there's like an ideal window for when people are active online for certain websites. Like they have like an algorithm, like people watch YouTube at this time, people are on Facebook at this time. So I was like trying to get the video posted in that slight window. And I was like, ah, it's not there yet. And you know, time went on and I was like, no, nah, nah, not, not quite. I don't think they're on Facebook just yet. And then next thing you know, it's uh, 12 o'clock at night and, or 12 o'clock in the morning, whichever one you want to say. And I hadn't posted it and I'm like, well, I guess that's not being posted. So you guys are kind of getting a shot in the dark of what I'll be talking about today, but that's, that's completely fine. It's, it's okay. Um, I named a lesson title, Four Things You May Have Missed About Daniel. And so like we talked about, uh, like I just talked about earlier, sometimes you miss things because you don't go back and visit them. Um, and that's one of my favorite things to do on YouTube. I like to look up Easter egg videos and videos about things that I may have missed from a movie that I watched or a show, an episode. Those are, like, if you look at my YouTube history, it's like Easter eggs about this Pixar movie, it's Easter eggs about Star Wars, Easter it's like full of those types of videos. And it kind of relates to us as Christians sometimes, and that's why I named the lesson title. I kind of stole it from YouTube. Hope I don't get copyrighted or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I titled the lesson that, hey, four things you might have missed when going through the story of Daniel. And like I said, there's a lot of times that you read through these stories and there's adult themes that you don't think about because you think of it as a children's story. Um, this one is especially going to reign true because it's a lot of, I mean, the Old Testament in general has a lot of violence in it. I don't, I don't think people realize that sometimes when they go through the Old Testament. Like, we, we kind of bounce around, but like, it was a very violent time in the Old Testament, like they were, I, I wish they would make a, a Old Testament movie that was true, because all the Old Testament movies have been bad from like people who've created them. I wish they would make a like super gory. I mean, that sounds bad, but like it, it would be, it would be cool to watch. Right? It'd be cool to watch like the wars and all that. Maybe I'm just, maybe that's just me being weird. But um, a lot of times we skip over that, or we we kind of like die it down for our younger audiences and things like that. But a lot of times you can learn a lot as an adult from visiting these stories again um, and a lot of times I know it wouldn't be me it wouldn't be me if I didn't mention my favorite show ever so all of you guys on the back left hand corner on my left whatever um, Avatar The Last Airbender kids show so called um, but it has a lot of adult themes in that show right so you watch um, you watch certain things as a kid or you watch certain things that are targeted towards children and you're like well okay like that's a kid show whatever but then you, if you actually watch it sometimes you you get like man that was actually really really deep and you don't really get that when you're a child but when you're an adult you get it um, and that happens a lot think about your Disney movies Disney is they're smart so Disney movies, like the Pixar movies, they're aimed towards children, right? But obviously, who's going to be taking those children to the movies? Adults, right? And so they have to find a way to convey a message for children, right? That children are going to like or convey something that children are going to, you know, be gravitate towards, but also making the adults where they just don't dread being there. Because how many, adult, like, how many times have you took your kid to a movie and you actually end up liking it? You're like, man, actually, I kind of like that. Or you're watching a TV show with your child and you're like, that's actually a pretty good show. Like it has, and it's because it has something from the best of both worlds. It, it, it brings something that the adults can also relate to as well as the children. And so as we dive into the book of Daniel and we talk about him specifically, the story of him being in the lion's den, let us uh, look at it from that adult perspective. Because some, some of us, this may be our first time visiting this story since we were little. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes you haven't visited in a few years. It's like watching an old movie and be like, oh man, I never saw that for the fifth time that I've seen it. I've never seen that. That's something new. And so hopefully I can get that from you today. So we'll be looking at the book of Daniel and we'll uh, go through chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Daniel chapter 6. It starts off, it says, It pleased Darius to set over a kingdom, 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over the three, uh, over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one of them. Uh, one of these satraps will give an account so that the king may suffer no loss. Then Daniel became the distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because of the excellent spirit that was in him. Um, so, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So you already get the idea that Daniel is becoming the man. 
Okay, so you know the king has all these high officials. He has he has his posse, he has his cabinet, whatever you want to call it. And Daniel is distinguishing himself among these people. The king's really gravitating towards Daniel, um, and it's because of the excellent spirit that was within him, right? And it's because of the Christian spirit that he had. And that's something to note, right? That's something that is very very good about Daniel. Uh, he didn't do really anything super special. It's not like he was, you know, uh, talking about the other high officials to the king and kind of making himself known a little better. He was just being himself, being the Christian man who he was. And so for us as Christians, the lesson we can take from that is sometimes just, hey, when you're at work, when you're at school, whatever, just be the Christian person that you are and you will get recognized. Sometimes you will make it to those high places where people will see that you're different and they will distinguish you above all else, right? So, let's talk about the plot. This is the plot that that happens when these things happen. When you get in these high positions, sometimes people just, they don't like that, right? So let's talk about what these high officials and what the uh, satraps and people did. And so then the high officials and satraps sought out to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found on him. Then the men said, we shall not find any grounds of complaint against Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of God. So that's another like kind of point to Daniel's Christian attitude. It's like, hey, okay, sorry. Um, hey, we're going to we're gonna try to find, we're just kind of trying to trip him up. Right? We, we got to get rid of this guy. I don't really like him. They're all talking about him. And they're like, okay, what do we do? What do we do? I can imagine him sitting like, hmm, okay, we could do, no, that's not going to work. And some guy's like, well, you got to attack him where it means the most to him. You, you got to find something that's going to relate to him and his God. And they're like, okay, all right, that sounds like a good plan. And I mean, what a great thing, what a great thing to say about somebody. You can't find fault unless you're going to make up something that is going to openly, where he's going to openly have to defy his God. That's a great thing to say about somebody. He's not going to, he's not going to waver unless it's directly related to his faith. And even then, we'll see, Daniel doesn't give. Okay, so these high officials and satraps came to agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, uh, and the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an order, ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes a petition to uh, any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into a den of lions. Can we talk about how cruel that is? Like, Man, I keep getting close to this. I'm sorry. Um, that's that's super cool. Uh, these guys are just sitting, talking. I, I, I kind of picture it like the Jedi Council. They're all kind of talking about, like, hey, okay, how are we going to get Daniel? All right, cool. We're going to do this. And they're like, all right, we're going to make a decree. We're going to have the king pass a decree. And 30 days, nobody can worship any other gods. They can't worship anybody but the king. Okay, so what's the punish for that? Hmm. Lion's Den. Oh, yeah, yeah, great. Like, wait, wait, wait. Well, I'd have been about, like, whoa, wait, Lion's Den? Like, you couldn't throw them in prison or, or like, you know, I don't, I don't know anything. But eaten by lions, like, that's pretty cool. Of, and that's the first one they suggested. There's no, you know, they don't show, the Bible doesn't show any type of other decision or thought process that they went to. That's the first one they went to. It's like, yep, yeah, we got a Lion's Den. That's where they'll go if they don't worship, you know, they don't worship in prison. The king, if they worship anybody for the next 30 days. That's pretty cruel stuff. And a lot of times we kind of skip over that thought of like, these men were cruel. Like, they, they wanted Daniel out that bad because they were that jealous that they were willing to just end his life. Not, not just make him uh, suffer, but to suffer in a way of being eaten by lions. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know how much you know about lions and them eating people or watched Animal Planet, but it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty gruesome stuff. And so let's, let's look at what Daniel's response to this is, because this is a beautiful response. So when Daniel knew that the document had been, uh, or actually, let's skip it. I'm skipping ahead. I'm sorry. So and on verse 7, all the officials of the kingdom, the prefects, the counselors agreed that established ordinance uh, 
and enforce injunction that whoever makes a petition to any god or man for 30 days except you shall be cast into a den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign it. Uh, sign the document so it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. So a lot, a lot of times we skip over this part that the king just signed it, or so we think, right? The king just, all right, well, sounds good. Stamp of approval. Go do your thing, right? That's what we think. That's originally kind of what you think. Like, the king's a cool person, too. He just signs this. No regrets, right? That's not true. We'll get to that later. But let's look at Daniel's response first. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to the house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. Daniel said, thrown in the den of lions? Okay. I'm not changing a single thing. And I feel like that's a response that a lot of us as Christians want to have, but that's not what we have. Uh, we, don't ch we, we change something slight to make it seem like we're, like we're trying to play both sides of the fence, right? You're trying to make it seem like you still have faith in God and you're still going to believe in Him and do, do the things you need to do, but you also compromise just enough so you don't get caught. I mean, how many times or how many examples of that do we see? Um, or how many times can we make an example where that might happen? happen. So say, um, one example that I thought of when I, when I was reading through is like, say if they said, hey, okay, we're not going to allow you to pray in schools anymore. You can't, like, you, you know, if we catch you praying in schools, you're going to get, you know, in trouble, you're going to get attention, you're going to get, whatever, you're going to get in some type of trouble for praying in schools. And your routine is, you, you know, you get your food, because I, I used to do this when I was high school, I'd get my food, I would sit down at the table, and I would say a prayer over my food. And all my friends knew that, and they were having conversations, they were quiet down, they, they knew that about me. But if suddenly a law came out to where I'm not allowed to do that anymore, what would I have done? And I would like to say that I wouldn't have changed anything, but honestly, I think I probably would have changed. I would have made it so that I was still able to pray and I'm still pleasing God, but I'm also not defying the rules. And so what would I have done? I would have been, you know, hey, um, it's okay, so I'm not allowed to pray. How can I? Oh, man, they don't have to know I'm praying. I can pray, pray my eyes open. They don't know, so I can just sit and act like I'm, you know, playing with my food or something like that and, you know, say a little quick prayer in my head. But is that, is that really what God wants us to do? Or should we be like Daniel? Daniel did not change a thing. See, Daniel could have did that same thing. He could have been like, okay, instead of three times a day, maybe I'll, I'll put it down to one. And then maybe they won't catch me. Or maybe I wouldn't do three. I, I wouldn't open the windows. And I, I maybe do not go outside because they can't catch me if I don't go outside. But the Lord's still pleased because I'm still praying to him. Not what Daniel does. Daniel goes, all right, well, throw the lines then. Sounds good. Whatever. I don't, I don't, I don't really care. I know God's going to take care of me. Does the same thing. Continues to does the same exact thing. Nothing changed with Daniel. And so let's, let's read on. Verse 11. Then these men came to agreement and found Daniel making petition and plead before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction. O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The things stand fast according to the law and meets of the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes a petition to, uh, his petition three times a day. So they, tra they pretty much trapped the king. Because I, I I don't think the king was thinking that anybody would actually do it. Because it hadn't been a problem up to this point. He trusts his high officials. And they came to him with this petition like, hey man, if the people don't worship you or they worship any God but you, yeah, sign kind a of petition, throw him in the den of lions. He just stamps it and goes, okay, like, whatever. I don't, like, I don't think he's thinking that somebody would actually defy him. And that person would be Daniel, right? He, he doesn't, he, he obviously is not thinking that. And so he just, hey, signs it. And then they're like, we got him now. They come up and they're like, hey, the, you know, Daniel, he's, he's worshiping God. He's petitioning to God. And the king's like, well, yeah, oh, uh, yeah. He was doing that, wasn't he? Ah, I did sign that decree, right? So his hands are pretty much tied because this is a binding document. This is something that they they really, uh, in old times and times, you know, the king signs something with his ring, it, it's serious business, right? It, it's it's not going to be revoked. The same, uh, the same, you see the same thing in the book of Esther um, with... Um, 
with him there and him signing his decrees and things like that. It's the same type of deal. It was very, very serious things. So we'll go read on in verse 14. Then the king, when he heard these words, was in so much distress. He set his hand, uh, or he set his mind to deliver Daniel. So he's like, okay, well, I like this guy, Daniel. Man, I might have made a mistake, but I can't go back. And he labored and signed until uh, the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said, O king, know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. They're reminding him, hey, look, king, you can't be soft. Like, he, he did it. He has to pay the consequences. I know you like this guy, but he has to pay the consequences. So what does the king do? We'll read on. The king commanded, and Daniel was brought, uh, and they cast him into the den of lions. Uh, the king declared to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. So this is the part that people don't really focus on. The king also has a little bit of faith. Right? So the king didn't want to king till didn't want to throw Daniel in the he had to, right? His hands are tied, right? He's he's bound by a document, says he has to, right? And he even says he he says, Hey, may the God whom you serve continually deliver you. Even in the previous verses, he's trying to stick up for Daniel and his God. And so it's important to realize the king's not some jerk who just wants Daniel dead and you know, he just wants to be away with him. He's like, Hey, you know, I'm tr- I have, my hands are tied. I have to do this. So he, he says, hey, may your God deliver you. Because, you know, I like you, Daniel. I, you're, obviously, you're making up to my, to my high graces for a reason. You're, you're working your way up the chain for a reason. I was going to set you above the kingdom. Um, so, obviously, he, like, he loves Daniel. Um, may your God deliver you. Uh, may your God whom you serve continue to deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the Nineveh lion, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring that the, uh, and the signet of his lords that nothing may be changed concerning Daniel. Now this is the part where sometimes my imagination as, my, as a kid doesn't match up, or the things that I was taught as a kid doesn't match up with the adult side of me. Because as a kid, a lion's den seems so kind of peaceful in a way. Have you ever seen a picture of the lion's den in the children's book? I wish I had one with me. I'll show it or a picture. It's like it's well lit, you know. The lions are just kind of sitting next to Daniel and just kind of chilling in the background there. And you're like, man, that actually, oh, okay, yeah, lions then. It doesn't seem so bad. It's like, no, that that's not. I mean, even if you go to the zoo, it gives you the wrong picture of what a lion's den would be like. You know, the zoo, you're like, you know, behind glass, like 10 inch thick glass that like bullets can't get through, or, or you're like sitting way like higher than them, and they're like way at the bottom, and you're like, okay, cool, it looks pretty, they're just roaming around, and these are trained lions, and so they were raised in captivity, so they're not vicious, they don't do anything, they're just very lazy. It's like, that's not what this was. This was a pit, dark, rolled, and they had to roll like a, essentially a stone over the top of it to, you know, to secure whatever, the pit, to secure the lions down there, um, and it was dark, and imagine just being down there. It probably smelled because, I mean, they had to feed the lions, right, at some point, and they probably fed it people, because, I mean, you see their first punishment was just, hey, throw them in the lion's den, so they probably, it probably was a form of punishment that they had for people, instead of throwing them in prison, hey, we got this lion's den, lions need to be fed, haven't been fed in a couple days, throw them in there, it probably smelled really bad, uh, bones and, and corpse everywhere, like, it's not the picture that you see in the children's book, but it's like, why, why would you show that to children, I mean, I get it, but at the same time, when you get older, you need to think about these things, because these details matter. Right? These details really matter for the story. So Daniel is being thrown into this. He's being thrown into a dark pit full of vicious animals, probably smells bad, um, and he's just he's down there with these animals. Let's let's see what happens. Um, uh, with the king, the king uh, went to his place and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then, at the break of day, the king arose and went to haste to the Daniel. So then, you get the, again the king's uh, kind of loyalty towards Daniel. Daniel, he he's make he's trying to make sure that Daniel's okay. Like he he believes that the God that Daniel serves is going to deliver him. So hey, break of day, break of day. He's going in checking on Daniel. Hey, I, oh man, I pray that this guy's not dead. I really hope that this guy's not dead. And as he came in the den where Daniel was, 
he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the king, has your God, whom you serve, continually be able to deliver you from the lions? So he's kind of shooting in the dark, like, hey, Dan, like almost like a, hey, Daniel, are you out there? Hey, Daniel, did like God do what he said he was going to do? Please tell me that God did what he said he was going to do. And Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent an angel to shut the mouths of the lion, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. So he, he escapes, right, without being unscathed. But do you think that that means that it wasn't scary for him? Honestly. I mean, I, I don't believe that for one second, right? That it was not scary for him. I mean, when you picture, when you picture the, uh, when I pictured it as was little, like him shutting the mouths of the lions, I just pictured that, like, no, they were no longer vicious, like they turned into little kittens or something. Like, oh, like, they're so cute. The guy closed the mouths of the lions, and now they're little kittens, he's petting them, and th- no, that, that, no. Like, they're still animals, and they're still huge and ferocious, and they, like, I would even venture to say, I mean, God obviously kept Daniel safe, but I would even venture to say that he was going to be scared that they would kill him another way. I mean, they, like, they have more than just their mouths. They have claws, they have things like, so I'm, I would be scared, like, all right, yeah, their mouths are closed, but that doesn't mean they can't just sit on me because they weigh 400 pounds and I just suffocate to death. And now when, you know, it's over, they open their mouths and now I'm dead. Um, and see, these, these are the important details that sometimes when you go back and read it as an adult, you don't really think about. Like, yeah, these are still animals. These are still huge, vicious, ferocious beasts. And God took care of Daniel in that situation. But it's still, it's still not a pleasant place to be in. It's still scary for Daniel. He, he's still in there. He's st- it's still dark. It still smells. That n- the bones of the corpse of people before him are still there. No- nothing has really changed besides the fact that they're not eating him. Um, and that's important to realize. Um, so Daniel, no fire was found, and the, and the king commanded. This is where the story gets interesting, right? And the king commanded that those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, and their they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered and broke all their bones into pieces. Um, that that's a pretty. That's that's pretty heavy. Uh, I don't remember any of my Bible class teachers teaching me that part. I think they just said, "Oh yeah," they, I, I, I just don't remember. They're like, "Oh man," they kind of just skipped over that part. It's like Daniel got brought out of the lions, and then it's like, "Oh, Dan, the king serves Daniel's God," and it's like, "Oh okay," and you're like, "Whoa," that whole section right there where it's like. Nah, the king was like, hey, you remember, yeah, I remember you guys, weren't you gotta, you, oh, yeah, you suggested what, to throw Daniel in the den of lions? Okay, yeah, that sounds like a good punishment for you, so why don't we just uh, do that to you? Oh, not just you, though, your wives, little Johnny, that you, I'm, I'm sorry, he, him too, like, he, he, all of you guys gotta go. It's like, wow, that was pre- that's pretty, that's um, pretty, it's pretty gruesome stuff. I mean, I mean, even the depiction, before they even reach the bottom. I mean, these lines are probably like, man, look, I'm hungry, man. Look, my mouth closed. Uh, wait, okay, Daniel's back up. It's like, man, that was my dinner. Ah, he let him, you let him get away. And then all of a sudden, uh, you get now, like, people are doing, oh, wait, hold more. Oh, done, dead, over. And you're like, uh, okay, well, like, this is, it's pretty gruesome stuff. And, but that's the picture that is painted. And that paints the, that makes the story, right? This this makes the story of Daniel powerful. And not to say that as a kid, missing that is going to you know drastically change your life, but as an adult, getting that just adds that much more depth to the Bible. It adds that much more to the story when you're able to read it and dissect it from a different perspective as you get older. Um, and that's, that's really important. So we'll go on and uh, read, read on. Then Darius wrote to the peoples of all nations and all languages, and the dwelling on earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all the royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. 
He delivers and he rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus and the Persian. So a lot of times we, we this is the part of the story where we pick back up. If you were, if you were little and you missed the whole bones breaking thing, you pick back up here and you're like, hey, yay, Daniel, Daniel, Daniel did it. And now the king is worshiping his God. Um, and it is important to know that the king had faith, right? The king obviously liked Daniel. He appreciated Daniel and he appreciated the God that Daniel served and the impact that Daniel had on this king's life was tremendous. Enough to where, hey, you know, he's making a decree to all people in all languages that the, the God, the same God that Daniel serves is the God that we will serve. How, how, how great is that, that a person like Daniel, who really didn't set himself apart in any way besides just having an excellent spirit, is able to change the life of a king? That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty profound, um, if you ask me. So let's get into like the lesson title, because I, I highlighted them, but let's actually highlight them. This is like the part of the YouTube video where they, they, they've gone through the story, but then they go back and like, ah, you may have missed this. This is, this is the part of the story where I do that, right? And so the four things that you might have missed from the story of Daniel is Daniel's position and the kind of parallel that it shows to Jesus. So when Daniel, when we talked about Daniel early in the book, that Daniel uh, was, uh, he, he rose to, to power. He's starting to make a name for himself, you could say. And then the people are not liking it. The people are, you know, the satraps, his, his royal officials, whatever, are not having it. They're not happy. Uh, who else does that remind you of? Jesus, right? Jesus, you know, he's making his name in his ministry. And uh, the Pharisees are kind of getting a whiff of what Jesus is putting down. And they're like, all right, we got to find a way to stop this guy, right? And so they're ploying to stop him just like these guys were ploying to stop. Daniel. And what did they say about Daniel that uh, was so profound? They could find no fault in him. Did they find any fault in Jesus? Right? And so the parallel between the, the character of Daniel, character, but being Daniel and Jesus, and that they were, they were men that, who were astound, uh, astounding for their spirit, their excellent spirit within them. They obviously had very good values, and the people did not like them, but they could not find any fault. And the only fault that they could find was the masters who they served. So for Jesus, that would have been God, and for Daniel, that would have been God. And so that, that, that parallel there, I think a lot of people miss. Like, hey, Hey, this is a very this is very uh, similar to kind of what Jesus went through. So that's that's number one. Number two, we kind of talked about a lot, but the true brutality of just the whole story, um, you know, them being thrown in the den of lions and lions eating, you know, their families and children. Uh, that's I mean that's something you kind of gloss over um, just because I mean you don't want to. Like you say, you don't want to tell that to little, little children, but at the same time, it's a part of the story, and it's a part of the story that sometimes, if you don't revisit it, or if you revisit it with that same mind frame, just reading through it, and you're like, all right, cool, Daniel saved, like, the king has faith now, and all the people worship Daniel. You kind of miss the fact that, like, yeah, these people were really brutally trying to kill Daniel, and then they ultimately shared the fate that they thought Daniel was going to share. So that's number two. And then um, number three, Daniel's unwavering faith. Um, this is one that you, I feel like you don't miss, but you still want to throw it in there because sometimes you may, that Daniel didn't change a thing. Daniel's faith stayed strong throughout the whole thing. Um, like I said earlier, a lot of times you feel like you can, um, you can kind of get away with making both parties happy. You can, you can say, all right, well, this decree came out or this law came out, but I can follow a little bit of the law and still worship God in, the, in a way that is going to, you know, where I can be secretive. For Daniel, that wasn't going to fly. He says, you know, I'm going to worship God the same way I've been doing it. And if they have a problem with it, then throw me in the den for the lions. That's, that's okay. Um, because he knows if, if he dies, then he gets to go to heaven and be with Christ, right? Or with God. And if he doesn't, then God is glorified still. And that's the attitude that we need to have. Hey, if something happens to me, um, and... 
let's be honest, nothing's gonna happen to you like that. Like it's, you know, we're, we're in a time where that type of level of persecution, at least here, um, doesn't exist. And so some of the worst things that may happen is a little bit of ridicule. Yeah, you might get picked on a little bit. You might suffer a little bit of some some punishment of some sort, but nothing to the gravity of being thrown in dense full lions. And God is going to be glorified either way. So it's important to draw that from the story. And then the last the last point is uh, the king's faith. Um, how the king um, obviously wanted Daniel um, to wanted Daniel's God to be worshipped as well. From the from the beginning of the story. You you don't really see it. You have to. You kind of have to draw it out at the end that Daniel truly cared about, or Daniel, the king really cared about Daniel and cared about the God that Daniel served. Um, and that's that's an important lesson to realize that sometimes the people will do things because they feel like their hands are tied. They feel like they can't do anything else. But deep down, they really do care, um, and they really do care about the God that you serve and your values. It's just a matter of getting the right opportunity to bring that out. Um, and so those are the four things that you might have missed from the story of Daniel and Lions Den. And like I said, I'm excited to dive more into the so-called children's stories that you uh, may not have visited in a long time or may have a completely um, wrong or, or misconstrued uh, opinion about what the story is trying to teach you. And so as we, as we close, um, I look forward to the future. I look forward to um, Nick and I, both of us kind of uh, working through these stories and these lessons together. Um, and as we have a time um, now that we can be together, um, that we can express our thoughts and our opinions, we just, uh, we're so thankful for that. Um, and we want to, uh, the invitation is always open. But if you've been at that place in your life where maybe uh, you've looked at these stories in a complete wrong perspective, it's okay. Um, it happens to the best of us happens uh, a lot and maybe you're in a different scenario and you're just just struggling as, as a whole with anything in your life. Maybe you need prayers of the congregation. Um, whatever you need, we're always here. We're always uh, willing to talk. The body of Christ is always willing to help you through and our elders are here to pray for you and give you those things that you need. Um, as you have this opportunity now and always uh, please come now as you stand and sing.
Michael, thank you for taking the time to share that lesson with us. And a reminder to all of us, the application that uh, I believe I got out of those four points. Um, despite Daniel's position, his character made an influence. Despite the brutality, he did not lose his faith. His unwavering faith had an influence on the king. And so when I hear those great examples of the things that maybe we just overlook sometimes, Michael, thank you, because it reminds us we all have an influence we can make, like Daniel. And so, thank you for the lesson. A few announcements for us this morning. You'll notice in the bulletin, the inside page or opposite of where the note section was for Michael's lesson, uh, there are three things of emphasis. In the top left-hand corner, you'll notice that it says, don't forget to shop for the baby shower uh, for the Sanford Pregnancy Center. Um, that is a domestic outreach that we are trying to participate and support in this community. Um, and so we are um, encouraging you to um, we'll buy those items that we have on the sheets that are in the foyer and uh, help us with that so that we can uh, bless them. Um, you'll notice in the center of the page, um, sadly, our sister uh, Lisa had to ask us to go ahead and announce that the um, went, uh, the, the ornament exchange was going to be canceled. December the 4th, it's not going to happen now, and primarily because of the safety concerns with COVID and other things, uh, we just want you to know that uh, and um, encourage Lisa. She uh, put a lot of time and energy into this, and um, let's pray for uh, that coming opportunity where we can do such things as an exchange like that and secret sisters that are going to uh, reveal in January. Let's look for the opportunities. Let's pray for the times of normality as we move forward. And then lastly on that page, on the, uh, towards the bottom left hand side, you'll notice it says, uh, have you picked up a shopping list for the Christmas baskets uh, for the homeless? We are uh, building backpacks uh, to give to the homeless. Uh, and uh, you can help participate in that. The list are also on the bulletin board in the foyer. Please, I encourage you to take one of those sheets and pick up those items. Um, this coming Wednesday night is going to be our annual song service. And today before you leave, uh, there is in the foyer, right outside the door here, on the bulletin board, a sheet where you can put down some of the songs that you would like for us to sing that night uh, as part of that service. Uh, my, um, uh, uh, Nick is going to be bringing us a devotional thought. and. Um, um, we want to be able to do this service as an encouragement to us as we go into the holiday season and we enjoy Thanksgiving and uh, the opportunities that we can have with our families. So, But remember to be safe with that. Uh, some updates. Uh, Betty Fiock did come through her surgery well. Um, she's recovering, but uh, we want to continue to pray for her as we do want to also continue to pray for their family and so that you would be with uh, remember Lou as he continues to make all the necessary um, uh, arrangements that need to be done to take care of his mama. Um, we want to pray for the Galloway family. Uh, the Galloway family has been hit hard with uh, uh, some sickness. And so we want to remember our sister Susan who is struggling with pneumonia. You know, Susan had recently undergone surgery. Uh, her immune system is a little bit compromised, so we want to pray for her and their family. Uh, we want to pray for Elaine. Uh, we want to remember her, and she has been weak, and um, we just want to pray for her strength and the family as a whole as they minister to her and they minister to each other. And of course, you didn't see Amy or Bill today. Uh, they got sick on their trip that they went on, and so uh, they've isolated themselves at home, and uh, we want to pray for them and remember them as well. And uh, this past week, um, Tim called us 
and said that Patrick wasn't feeling good. So uh, he stayed home with Patrick, and this morning he wasn't feeling good. So I hope they haven't gotten the flu or something like that. But let's just pray for this entire Galloway family, uh, the O'Keefe's, the Smiths. Um, and remember Brother George. Brother George is at home. He's not able to be out right now while he's receiving uh, treatments uh, for a... Um, well, kind of a virus that he has. He's getting infusions. He has a nurse coming to see him. So let's pray for him and Jeanette uh, and the family as they pray and are concerned for him. I don't have any other announcements, so I would ask you to join me at this time and let's pray together for our family as a whole, thanking God for the opportunity to be here today and enjoy the blessings that he has. But to intervene where there is need, whether it be in sickness, whether it be emotional or physical, we pray for God to intervene. Pray with me, would you? Our Father in heaven, you are in total control, and we trust that. And Father, the things that we go through on a daily basis, they test us and they try us. And Father, we just pray that as we go through these circumstances, that we remember to trust you like Daniel. And Father, that we remember to keep that uh, excellent spirit within ourselves, knowing that we are your redeemed people, that you love us dearly and you care for us. Father, that our positiveness can make a difference in those around us. Father, that we can be a blessing to others and encourage them when they might be down in the way they are looking at things. Father, whether it be the physical needs of the body when those are sick, or the emotional traumas, Father, that we go through in life. We pray, Father, that you would intercede, that you would answer, that you would minister as needed. We thank you for Jesus, Father, and all the blessings that we have in him. And Father, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to be together this morning. Bless us each with safety. Watch over us and keep us. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.